Question six starts off with uniform motion. So we have a motorbike B traveling with speed 5.5 meters per second. So that's gonna be our initial velocity, 5.5, and a constant acceleration of 0 0.5 meters per second squared. So we'll put 0 0.5 there. On a straight stretch of road, and then it's overtaken at a road sign S by car C, which is traveling with 11 meters per second. So that's car C's initial velocity and constant acceleration 0 0.125. So we know all those. Calculate the greatest distance that car C is ahead of motorbike B. So basically how we're gonna do this is we have, we don't know, first of all, the greatest distance couldn't happen before it gets overtaken because we actually don't know anything about what happens before it's overtaken. And then after it's overtaken, the way we find the greatest distance is by letting the velocity, the final velocities of each kind of thing that's moving, the final velocities of B and C, let them equal to each other. The reason for this is that if you imagine, so what, what we have is we have B and it's overtaken by the car C. So I'm just going to look at any random point in the motion, maybe just after it gets overtaken. And we were, car C is going at 11 and car B is going at 5.5. So car C is going to be getting further and further away from B as time goes on. But B is accelerating faster than car C. So B is accelerating with 0 0.5 meters per second and C is accelerating with 1, 0 0.125. So that means eventually the velocity of B is actually going to keep getting bigger and bigger until B is going faster than C. And once B is going faster than C, B is actually going to start getting closer to C and that gap's going to close. And right before that happens, so imagine C has the bigger velocities moving further away, but then B gets closer and closer. When their velocities are equal, then B starts getting faster than C and then it starts getting closer. Therefore, we want to let the velocities equal, the final velocities, because that's when they're going to be furthest apart. So since both of our velocities will have to be equal, I'm going to just call them both V. So technically these aren't equalities because V equals V. I'm just going to call the final velocity of each one V is what I'm saying there. And um, we can call the distance, the displacement of B and the displacement of C, just SB and SC. And um, we can also just remember that they overtake at a road sign C, S, sorry. So this is the point S and the displacement that we're measuring is just the distance between the two particles. So this is SB, this is how far B is away from S, and this is SC, it's how far C is away from S. This is SC. And then finally, well, we're measuring from the same point. We're measuring from the point that they get overtaken at S, so the time that's elapsed for both is also going to be the same, and we'll just call it T. So now SB and SC, we don't have any kind of relationship between those, so we don't really want to bother with those yet, even though that is ultimately what we're looking for. Instead, we want to make use of the information we do know, which is these four. It's because these two are the same, these two are the same. So we can get one equation with this and one equation with this. Then we'll have two equations with two unknowns and we can solve that simultaneously. So for B, uh, we have V, U, A, and T. So we'll use V equals U plus A, T. So we're going to have that V equals U, which is 5.5, plus A, which is 0 0.5, and then T is just T. And then for C, we'll have that same equation, V equals U plus A, T. We'll have that V equals 11 plus 0 0.125 t. And now since both of these are equal to v, they're both going to be equal to each other, or you could do the thing where you line them up and then subtract from each other, but it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to let them both equal to each other since they're both equal to v. So you have that 5.5 plus 0 0.5 t, that's 0 0.05, 0 0.5 t equals 11 plus 0 0.15 t. Uh, just bring like terms to each side and we'll get that 0 .0 0.375t is equal to 5.5. Divide both sides by the 0 0.375, and we get that 5.5. I'm very bad at drawing fives. 5.5 over 0 0.375, and that's going to be equal to... That'll be equal to 44 over 3 seconds, because we're talking about time. Uh, you could write it as a decimal, but it's usually better to leave it as a fraction just so we get a more accurate answer. And now that we know what t is, if we look back up here, uh, we know what our t is. Well, we don't have to write it in, but we know what our t is. And now, remember, we're looking for the distance between the two particles. So basically, now that if we know t, we know a, we know u, we know 3, and then we can figure out what s is. So we can do that for b and c. So now to find s for b... 
So for B, we'll have that SB, we can use S equals UT plus a half AT squared, because we have S, U, A, and T. We're not worried about V. Well, then S, B equals U, which is 5.5. UT, so times 44 over 3, plus a half times A, which is 5, 0 0.5, times T squared, which is 44 over 3 squared. Put that into your calculator. And you get 1, 2, 1, 0 over 9. Now we just need to calculate it for C. So we're going to use the same thing. SC equals UT. So U for C is 11. So 11T is 44 over 3. Plus a half times A, which is 0 0.125. Times T squared, which is 44 over 3 squared. Put that into your calculator. And you get 1573 over 9. So then, of course, the gap between them will just be SC minus SB, which is equal to 1573 over 9 minus 1210 over 9. Put that into your calculator. And you get the answer to be 121 over 3 meters, which you can write as a decimal if you want, but the fraction is fine. In part 2, we're asked to calculate the distance from S to the point where B overtakes C. So the initial velocity and the acceleration, are they're all going to be the same. But when they overtake each other, that's basically when their displacements are equal. So I'm just going to let both of their displacements be x, because I'm bad at writing, I'm bad at writing s's. And then their velocities could be different, technically, because when they overtake, obviously, if b is overtaking c, b has to be going faster than c. So their final velocities will be different. But then the time will be the same, because we're measuring from the same point. And when they get overtaken, well, obviously, the time to that point will be the same for both. And we can just solve these equations. So we can use s equals ut plus a half at squared for each. We can, for b, we'll have that x equals 5.5t plus a half at squared. So we'll have 0 0.5, I'll keep doing 0 0.05, 0 0.5 over two times t squared. And then for c, we'll have that x equals 11t plus 0 0.125 over 2, a half a, and then times t squared. Now, since both of these are equal to x, they're equal to each other. So what we can say is that 5.5t plus, that'll be t squared over 4, equals 11t plus, and if that's an eighth, then this will be a sixteenth. So we'll get t squared over 16. Now, we can multiply, we can actually just collect like terms quickly. So we bring the t squareds to the left side, we'll get 3t squared over 16 equals, bring the t's, actually, we, if we bring them all to one side, it'll work out nicer. If we bring the t to the other side as well, we'll get minus 5.5t equals 0. Now we just have to solve this quadratic. We can factor out a t and get that t times 3t over 16 minus 5.5 equals 0. And if this whole thing is equal to 0, either this is equal to 0 or this is equal to 0. So obviously one solution is that t equals zero, which is a given, because remember they start at the same point. So obviously their displacements are the same at the start. And then the other thing that could be equal to zero, which the other time that they uh, overtake each other is when this is equal to zero. And if we just solve this, so bring the 5.5 to the other side and multiply that by 16 and divide it by three, we get t equals 5.5 times, that's about x, times 16, divide it by three, put that into your calculator and you get, you end up getting 88 over 3 seconds is when they will overtake each other. But they ask for the distance from S to the point where B overtakes C. So what we're actually looking for is this X. X is when they overtake each other. That's how far away they will be from the starting point. So we can just plug this into one of our equations. I'll just use this one because, as you can see, it's a little simpler. So I'm just going to copy this one down. Except we're going to replace each of the T's with 88 over 3. So we'll have x equals 5.5, replace that t with an 88 over 3. And this t squared is just going to be 88 over 3 all squared. Squared, put that into your calculator. And you get that x is equal to 3388 over 9 meters. Which again, you can write as a decimal, but it's more accurate if you leave it as a fraction. In the next part, they ask us to sketch the shape of the displacement time graph. So that's important. We're talking about a displacement time graph. Oops for the displacement of B relative to S. So remember, S is just the starting point. So that's just the displacement of B. 
for the first 30 seconds after it passes S, use the same axes, then sketch the shape of the displacement time graph for the displacement of C relative to S, and include a scale. So it says for the first 30 seconds, so we can put 30 seconds up here as our kind of like ending point, I suppose. Um, as well as that, we can figure out the distance where they overtake each other, because this 88 over 3, that's almost equal to 30 seconds. So this is just below 30 seconds. And we know that just before 30 seconds, um, they will overtake each other at this number of meters. And this is about 376.44 meters. So it's almost 400. So we can use 400 as our other scale. Um, you could technically just calculate all the numbers like using the equations from above. But the problem with that is it's quite time consuming and they didn't give you space to calculate that. So that suggests that they just want you to, as they say here, sketch it. They don't want like something super accurate, just the, roughly the shape. So remember for a displacement time graph, because um, we have acceleration, uh, displacement, the displacement function is given by a quadratic here in terms of t squared. So basically the general shape of a quadratic, and since they're accelerating, it's going to be kind of curving up a bit, except their acceleration is quite low, so it's not going to be super noticeable. But basically what happens is we have b, which is starts off slower, but so it's going to be moving slower at the start, but it has a faster acceleration. So the slope is going to be higher. We're told to do B first. Yep. So they're both going to start from here. I'll do B in red. So it's going to start off slower. So it's not going to be covering as much ground. Now, I apologize. Doing this on a drawing tablet is quite difficult. So it's going to start off quite slowly because um, obviously that's bad. Obviously, it's... um. It starts off slower, but it kind of accelerates faster. And it's going to be slowly but surely kind of going upwards until we get to 30, where it's going to be about there. Um, and then we could say that the other one, it's going to start off faster, so it's going to cover... So that's for S of SB. The other one's going to start off faster, so it's going to be covering more kind of ground at the start quicker, but it's going to be kind of, it's not going to, um, it's going to not pick up speed as much. So it's the slope's not going to be as much as this. And I didn't even draw this really well with the slope. So, um, I'll give it my best go. I might end up pausing the video and just kind of doing it a bit better, but it's going to start off steeper, but then it's not going to be accelerating as quickly. So it'll eventually get overtaken. And when it gets overtaken, we're hoping, remember they get overtaken at three, seven, six. That's about, we could say it's about here. Because if we take this to be, or we take this to be 350, 300, 250, 200, yeah, 150, 150, and then zero, that works out. So 375, or is that's about what it is, isn't it? Yeah, so they overtake about here, so we want them to intersect about here, and that'll be at about 20 something seconds. It's almost 30, I don't have the exact number. So yeah, they should intersect about here, roughly. So we want them to intersect about here. So it's going to start off faster. And it is also going to be sloping up, but just not as quickly. Again, I can't do this very well on the tablet, but you can kind of say that it's not sloping up as quickly. And then it gets overtaken, and it's kind of like that. So it's a very bad drawing, but that's roughly it. Um, And that's SC. You should probably have them sloping a bit better. So this starts off sloping higher and then it just doesn't increase as much and then it gets overtaken. But I'll try to sketch it better and I'll resume the video and just show that quickly. So I did it again and this is kind of the main point. You can see SB is increasing but not su super quickly and it starts off by covering less ground because it's going slower at the start. And then SC starts off going faster but then it's not increasing. You can't, it's not really increasing at all because the acceleration is so slow. And therefore, it just almost looks like a straight line. And then they overtake about here. It doesn't have to be super accurate. If you had time and you wanted to be super exact, you could do some numbers and some calculations with the formulae above. Get some of the main points. And this is the way the marking scheme shows it. But yeah, I wouldn't worry too much. I don't think they'd ask that on like an actual exam. As is in the description of each of these videos, the deferred exams are a little bit rushed and not as well thought out. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Plus it was only worth five marks, but yeah, it should be something generally about the shape and you should get your marks for it. Part B is the first time we've seen dynamic programming on a higher level exam. So this isn't super um, important. We're just trying to find the shortest path, the cheapest plan. 
So we're just made, meant to do dynamic programming on this. How can you tell? It's broken up into stages and we can't do Dijkstra's algorithm with negative numbers. So the only other algorithm we can use is dynamic programming or Bellman's algorithm. So they gave you about a box and a half to answer this, but um, unless they tell you to use the box, I personally prefer to do it on the graph just because it takes less time and it's just a bit simpler to me. But if you're kind of running low on space or you're more used to using the boxes, then you can do that. So I'm going to start off by, remember we work backwards, so we're trying to find x to y, I think. What does it say? Yeah, so x and y are the initial and final, so y is going to be our final one. So we have y here, and we're going to have a look at each of the three other ones and how long it takes for them to get back to y. So for f, we'll have 26 going to y. For g, we'll have 47 going to y. And for h, we'll have 24 going to y. And of course, these are the only options for each of these nodes, so these have to be the optimal ones. So we mark them all as optimal. Um, then for our next stage, we have D, and for each of these we have two options. So for D, we could either do 28 plus 26, which is 54, going through F, or we could have this tw 23 belongs at this edge, because otherwise this 35 would have nowhere to go. So we have 35 plus 24 is 59, going through H. Of course, we're going to take the 54 through F as our optimal policy for D. So we can kind of just, I'd highlight these red or something. Or maybe you could also, I think it might be a good idea if you redraw this in your um, box below. But for now, I'm just going to highlight it red or, or yeah, just so I can kind of remember. And then I might draw it below at the end. So all of these are optimal. So we'll just draw arrows through each one. Like so. Didn't do that very well. There we go. Um, and then for E, we'll have the 23 going up to F. So 23 plus 26, that'll give us 49 going through F. I actually might write them beneath just to give myself more space. Well, 49 through F, we're going to have minus 5 plus 42. That'll give us 40, 47, sorry. That'll give us 42 through G. Of course, that's better. That's our optimal policy for E. So for E, we always want to go to G since that'll be better. For the stage before that, we only have one option for A, so we'll have the 7 plus the 54, since that's our optimal policy there. We'll have 61 going through D, and that's the only policy, so that's the best one. Um, here for B, we have two options. We have minus 9 with the 54, it'll give us 45 going through D. Or we'll have B to E, which is 42 plus 4, which is 46 going through E. Of course, 45 is better, so we will choose that and just highlight going down. Sorry, we're going to go with the one to D smaller and same up here just for the a even though it's obvious i'm just going to color it in red anyway and then finally for c we'll have 11 plus 42 which is 53 going to e that's our only option so that's the best one for c finally for x we have three options 12 plus 61 will be 73 going through a we'll have 15 plus 45 which would be 60 only going through B and then we have 8 plus 53 which would be 61 going through C of course the 60 through B is our best so we draw an arrow here going to B and this is we're now done with dynamic programming since we finished this reached the start again so when we redraw our thing below and this is kind of a way of showing your workings in the marking scheme they just have the big table which is also good if you want to use the table but I think this is just a bit faster unless you prefer the table or you have to use the table, but in this case, they don't tell you. So um, we found here that the cheapest cost, that should be red again, the cheapest cost was 60, and um, they didn't tell us any units. It didn't say in euros or anything, so 60 is the optimal policy. So 60 is the cost or optimal policy, and it also says to state the route, I believe, uh, the plan which minimizes the cost of maintaining the road. So you would have to kind of make sure that you're telling what is the plan, what decisions are they actually going to make. Well, let's have a look. We'll have X going to B, which goes to D, which goes to F, which goes to Y. You can just read that straight off the graph. Um, you probably don't need to say what the optimal policy is or what the cost is because it just says what's the plan that minimizes the cost. So yeah, that's it for part B. It's still probably a good idea just to say the cost just in case, but yeah, that's it.